All right, we'll get underway. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Marquette University Law School, Eckstein Hall. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues, a new semester of events here at the law school. As many of you know, this is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people who are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today, we are joined by the former senator from the state of Wisconsin and the current Democratic candidate for the U.S. Senate. Won't you please welcome Russ Feingold. Well, uh, I think it was back in last summer when you announced your, uh, your plans that you were going to run uh, for the office. Uh, I said to you, uh, I think on my TV show, you had a good life. You <laughs> said you uh, uh, left office. Uh, you had uh, taught here at uh, Lawrence University in Stanford. You've written a book, While America Sleeps. You've done some work that I know you uh, consider very important, a special envoy of the State Department, work in the Great Lakes region in Africa. So you did all these things, and, and I know you, uh, you enjoyed it. So people sitting in this room wondering, why? Why do you want to get back in to the political fray? Or as I said, why do you want to go back to the land of dysfunction? Why? Fair enough. Uh, look, when I uh, had an opportunity to do some other things, thank God somebody gave me a job. And, and Dean Kearney offered me a job. <laughs> so I had a wonderful year here, and I just want to acknowledge both Dean Kearney and Dean Parlow, who made this one of the best experiences I've ever had. And, you know, I'll tell you, Mike, the experience of teaching at various universities, meeting the young people of this generation, that had a huge impact on me, because I had never had, never been in that perspective. I'd been a student, but I'd never really been on the other end of it. And, and I'll tell you, one of the things that really made me feel strongly about it was here at Marquette, in the classes, the students were sort of, I don't know if they were 50-50, conservative, liberal, but it was a mix. And what was consistent was the respect. Respect for me, the respect for each other, and it made me think about how that sort of lost from the political process. And so, as time went on, private citizen here in the state, I see what's happening. I see the attack on the unity of the state the attack on the bipartisanship that I grew up believing in, the attack on the consensus on the environment, the attack on the university system. I see all of that, and yes, I'm having a good life. Mm -hmm. And then I realize the thing I love best was serving the people of Wisconsin, and they're hurting. They're hurting because they've been treated shabbily. And I felt it was my responsibility, as well as my desire, to be somebody that part of a team to try to bring us back together. And that's a joyful thing to be part of, Mike. So, so why the Senate, and why not? Why didn't you run for governor, given what you just said? Well, <laughs> no, I mean, I, no, I, that's, that's a fair, fair logical question. It's a fair it question. In fact, I, when you were uh, asking the, the first question, what I realized was that when Herb Cole decided not to run again, a number of my former colleagues called me up, and they said, Russ, you got to run. Come on. Come on back if you can. We'll do so many great things together. And I said, how's it going? And they said, this is terrible. We can't get anything done. It's awful. So there was this element. But you know, it made me think. I believe that the United States Senate is a terribly important part of the founders' vision of this nation. They chose a bicameral system where one of the houses would be elected in a different way for different terms. And the theory is that people would sort of work together and be more considered, be the cooling saucer of our government. But as one of the students here at Marquette Law School said to me, it was never intended to be, yes, the cooling saucer, but not the deep freezer. <laughs> and that's what it's become. So I, I thought to myself, well, look, I have the experience and the background of being a bipartisan person and an independent person in the US Senate. That's where I think I can contribute, by getting us back to that kind of ethic in the United States Senate. And there are still many people there that I've worked with before on the Republican side as well as the Democrat side. I think I can hit the ground running, try to turn that around. And I think that would improve the American people's view of their government if the Senate was more functional. When you got into the race, my sense of it was that this might very well be an election about differing economic visions, differing visions about the role of government. Um, and now we've had this new issue. It's, it was an issue, but now it's taken greater prominence, national security. Um, foreign policy. Has the focus of this election changed fundamentally? 
Not as far as I know. I was in Washington on 9-11. As far as I'm concerned, the, the number one priority for the American people ever since then and continuing into the future is protecting the American people. As you know, when I wrote a book, they said I could write what I wanted about. I wrote about the fact that I didn't think the threat from these extremist groups was over. I was even critical of the Obama administration for saying, well, we've sort of got al-Qaeda on the run. So I was trying to warn way back in 2011, even when I wasn't in office, about things like Boko Haram, AQIM in Africa, Al-Shabaab and others, and of course now with the emergence of ISIS. So to me, you can't have an election, if you're serious, about just foreign policy or national security and domestic issues. But I will tell you that after I announced in May, I didn't go do a lot of interviews, as you know. I didn't do a lot of telling people what I think. I went and visited all 72 counties. And what people told me overwhelmingly is that the leading concern of Wisconsinites, especially working in middle class families, is they're finding it really hard to pay the bills. Even though the economic recovery has started and is helping people at the top. That's what I heard the most about. Particularly things like the cost of higher education. The fact that the minimum wage is way too low. The fact that families really would like some family leave when they have a child. So that's what I heard. And so, Mike, mm -hmm. it really can be about both. In fact, you can't be a good U.S. Senator if you can't handle both. That's the job. It has an international and a domestic side, and I feel that that's something I can do. Well, we'll talk about the, uh, both in the next, uh, next uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, but I, let's get into some of the specifics of these issues and, and your response to what you heard from the people of Wisconsin. So on the minimum wage, that was one of the things you talked about right out of the blocks. You want to see a hike in the minimum wage. 15 bucks an hour is what you want yes, to see? Yes, I do. And, and I'll tell you, this is a, a big difference between me and the incumbent senator. The incumbent senator does not believe, and has said several times, there shouldn't even be a federal minimum wage, even though it's terribly low. $7.25. He's repeatedly voted against it. I think the fight for 15 people are making a good case. And the case is not just about making sure people can make ends meet. It's also for businesses. Let's face it. If people don't have money to spend, if they're sitting there desperately trying to figure out what to do, you can't sell your products. And this year, we're doing all 72 counties again. And we've already been to 22 counties visiting innovative businesses or famous Wisconsin businesses. If people don't make enough money to have a little bit extra, they're not going to buy that washing machine made in Ripon. They're not going to buy that fishing lure, that kind of newfangled fishing lure that they might make in Stevens Point. They're not, they're not going to buy the things that you buy when you have a little bit of extra money. And so this has an enormous impact on our business community. We have to remember that. And of course it's about the families. Of course it's about having your basic needs. But that's how it works. People have to have some cash. And so I think the case has been made that it's way too low, and I certainly philosophically believe we should have a federal minimum wage. And, and the argument that you hear from people like Congressman Ryan, Speaker Ryan, for example, is that if we raise the minimum wage to $15, uh, employers will have to make hard decisions about how many people they can hire. Um, what do you say to that argument? Well, you know, there's all kinds of debates among economists and others about what level it is where that happens. I've seen some people say that at $12, that doesn't happen, but it does happen at $15, and vice versa. It's going to be a battle just to get it up from $7.25. But I'll tell you, I think there's a very good chance that the amount of dislocation that would occur from a $15 minimum wage or something even just a little bit lower than that would be far less than the benefit of having Wisconsin families have some money. I really think that's good for our economy. So, I, I, you know, we don't know for sure. Uh, but, you know, if Congressman Ryan thinks that $12 is, is going to be okay, if he's willing to go for that, let's talk. Community college, uh, the president pushing hard to have free community college. Bernie Sanders would like to go even further. He says, you know, we should have free uh, tuition at public universities. Where do you stand on that? Well, I think we should try to get to free tuition. Uh, but there are several things we should do to make uh, college uh, more affordable as well as post-secondary education. First of all, if you have a student loan already, you should be able to negotiate a lower interest rate, which is what uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren has proposed. Uh, for, unfortunately, the incumbent senator voted against that. I would co-sponsor it. So you have to make the current loans more affordable. You also have to make sure that if the federal government uh, gets a, a profit or makes money off of the loan system, 
that that money isn't used for other things, but is actually used to reduce the cost of education. But I do like the broader vision that all the Democrat presidential candidates and Tammy Baldwin and others are talking about, which is let's try to have a goal where at least the tuition uh, could be free, where you wouldn't have to take it in. Now, you know, for example, University of Wisconsin-Madison for a year, it's about $24,000. About ten to 11000 of that is tuition. There's still going to be expenses. You may still have to figure out a way to pay for that. But if we can work toward that kind of tuition-free system, I think it would make a world of difference for the young people. And Mike, I have been to seven or eight campuses. Today I already did one at Whitewater. You should see the look on the faces of young people when they talk about this student debt they have. We never had to worry about that. When Ron Johnson and I were in college, he at the University of Minnesota, I at the University of Wisconsin, the tuition was about $600. We didn't have to worry about starting life with an average of $28,000 on average of debt. Uh, people have said that students like to do this because it's, quote, free money. You should see how they react when you say that. It's just downright scary and upsetting. And recently I had a meeting with one of the top realtors in the state. And I said, well, what are your priorities? I'm reaching out to every business group and really enjoying learning. And he said two predictable things that I agree with. One is the mortgage interest deduction. I want to see that preserved because it's essential for getting a home. Secondly, he said the property tax deduction because in Wisconsin we have very high property taxes. But his third thing he said, kind of, I was a little surprised, he said student loans, realtor. Not hard to figure out. If you're paying student loans, you're not going to buy a house very easily. So again, even less like on the minimum wage, it's not just about whether you take care of the students. It's about whether they have the wherewithal when they have good jobs to buy a house. How, Which, how do we pay for it? What, what has to give? I'll tell you a lot has to give, and one thing has to give is the fact that uh, foreign corpor these corporations are using this system to go over overseas and avoid what some people estimate is $2.1 trillion in, in taxes. And, and we need to figure out a way to change that. Uh, Senator Durbin already has a bill that would change the way that's figured out. Uh, some of the estimates are that could get us $100 billion a year to begin with. Others say just by tightening it, it could be 40 or $50 billion. But that money uh, could be used to pay for a new program. But the program, as some of the presidential candidates have talked about, to get this kind of tuition relief, should be a partnership between the federal government, the state government, the universities, and families. And the idea would be a block grant, where the federal government puts up money, but the state has to come back and, and do its job. When we were growing up, the University of Wisconsin, uh, of course, the state covered a, a great deal of, of a person's tuition. That has changed dramatically. So if we provided incentive to the states, with the universities themselves being responsible in how they spend money, and families doing what they can, I think that's the kind of program that it would be a good way to spend those tax dollars that should be back here. Let, let me follow up on something you, you just mentioned, and, and this is a, a big story. It's a big story in the world of business here in Milwaukee. Uh, many of you in this room know Johnson Controls, the uh, Milwaukee area firm, uh, corporate, big corporation, Fortune 500 company, uh, is merging with Tyco, and it will locate its new global uh, headquarters in Cork, Ireland. And, and the reason for that is, as you touched on this, the reason for that is that Ireland has a much lower corporate tax rate, um, about 12.5% compared to this country's 35%. Johnson Control says we can save $150 million a year in taxes. We are being responsible to our shareholders by making this move. What's your reaction to the decision by Johnson Controls? Uh, some people uh, say it's all about the math. Uh, some people say it's unpatriotic. Where do you stand on that? First thing I want to say is Johnson Controls is a great company. They have done wonderful things, some of the most innovative things of any company in the country with regard to energy and environmental issues. So I am a great admirer. I want them to stay here. I want them to have as much as their operation here, and I want to be sure that the jobs stay here. But we can change federal tax policy with progressive legislation that would make it less attractive. I mean, if it's just the math, let's make it less attractive for them to do something like this. And what Senator Bur Durbin's bill does is say, look, if you're not really moving your operations over there, if it's not really a foreign operation, under that scenario, you don't get the same benefit. So you reduce the benefit. Now, my opponent 
and other Republicans like to say, no, what we need to do is, is just get rid of the corporate tax. No, that's not necessary. Or lower it dramatically. Well, but look, there can be negotiations about that. Uh, President Obama's talked about going down to 19 percent. But what they really want to do is not have a corporate tax. And I, I don't think that's right, but reasonable people can agree. If they really come back here and repatriate that money here, maybe there can be some relief on the corporate tax. But I don't think we have to completely go hog wild and not, and not have revenue from this. That would be crazy. But reasonableness can prevail here. And I think it's uh, important because we don't want companies like uh, Johnson Controls to make moves like this, if at all possible. Let's talk trade for a moment, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP deal. Uh, President Obama has been pushing this hard. He said this would create a lot of opportunities for American companies to export uh, uh, to uh, the Pacific Rim nations. We should do it. We should step up and, uh, and go forward with this. Um, its future is uncertain. My sense is you're opposed. You don't think this is a good idea. It's better than, my, than your sense. I said I was opposed yeah. on the first day yeah. that I was running. Yeah, look, this, this thing is a classic example of an unbalanced trade agreement. And I've had a lot of experience with this. When I was new to the Senate, I had uh, my president, Bill Clinton, and Al Gore, and Newt Gingrich, and Bob Dole. They were all for NAFTA. And I voted against it. And I believe the statistics are that overall NAFTA and GATT and these other agreements have caught, cost this state some 70,000 jobs. The incumbent senator says it's a wash. No, it's not. It's been devastating. If you spend real time up in the Fox River Valley in some of those communities, you see what these bad tra trade deals have done. And, and time and again, Mike, these deals say language about enforcement for protect workers' rights and that sort of thing, but it's never enforced. And here I part company with the president. I agree with him on many things. But he said in 2008 that he would renegotiate NAFTA. Didn't do anything with regard. With, with regard to the trade agreements that have been passed and that the incumbent senator has voted for, they haven't ever enforced those worker provisions. So what good does it do the workers in Wisconsin if the agreements are essentially phony in this regard? By the way, this agreement puts corporations in the same position as foreign countries, basically, in terms of their ability to challenge the laws that we pass here in the United States and at the state level to protect our environment, to protect safe food. This is a very bad idea. And so, and I'm surprised that the incumbent, even though he's always said these agreements are good because they're, quote, creative destruction, he hasn't even said how he's going to vote on it. I think what Senator McConnell is trying to do is delay the vote till after the election so they can jam it through. I'd like to see him vote on it now and find out who's for this and who's against it. In 2010, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, was a, a big issue in your race. Senator Johnson very much opposed to it. Um, I assume you're going to be asked to defend your support of that program. How will you defend it in this uh, <laughs> This election I've cycle. already been there and done that yeah. <laughs> in 2010, and I'll do it again. It was the right vote. But, you know, people were being told then, the, the biggest pile of you-know-what, about what was in the bill. My goodness. Going to town meetings and having people saying, we understand there's going to be death panels. We, we understand that our personal financial information can be taken. It was a conscious attempt to make people think the bill was something it wasn't, following the strategy of the tobacco companies in climate change denial. It's, it's a game that's played. So people's ideas were twisted about it. But now, the idea of getting rid of it is not so popular. 16 to 17 million people have insurance that didn't used to have it. Now your son or daughter can stay on that insurance, your insurance, till they're 27 years old. You can't be taken off because of pre-existing conditions. <laughs> Various therapies, physical therapy and others, don't have an automatic cap. And yes, for those talking about the issue of drugs, the enormous problem of drugs in our society, this provides drug treatment money. So I am looking forward to being able to say, look, we're not going to go back and undo this thing. They've tried the court challenges. And there are improvements that can be made. I look forward to those. There's a, something called the family glitch which, you know, is a legitimate issue, which is where your eligibility for Obamacare is sort of determined as, by, as an individual rather than as a family. I didn't think it was a good idea that this Cadillac, these Cadillac programs, even though I don't like the name, weren't protected because a high, very good insurance policy should be protected. Those things can be now fixed. And, and let's be clear, the difference between me on this where I took my vote, stood with it, and was consistent. The incumbent senator decided to sue. He brought a lawsuit against this, 
in federal court in front of a Republican appointed judge in Green Bay, and the judge threw it right out. So then he went down, he personally attended that oral argument, he went right down to Chicago, and he took it to the Court of Appeals, and they just slapped it down. Is this really how you bring people together in our society? It's sort of ironic, because he ran against me because I was a lawyer. <laughs> but he's the one that was litigating this thing. And, you know, it was a frivolous lawsuit. So I want to be constructive. I want to work with all the health-related interests in this state and consumers. What else needs to be done? Something like health care, Mike, it's always going to be an issue. But we now have a better foundation, more people are covered, and I think uh, it's something that, that was the right thing to do. I, I want to ask you a, a political question, uh, and then we'll segue into uh, foreign policy and national security. But my political question is this. Um, on many of the issues we've talked about, uh, you and Bernie Sanders would probably agree. Um, what do you think of his candidacy? And, and do you think um, he could be the nominee? If he were the nominee, would you be comfortable supporting him? Oh, I'll support the Democratic nominee, whoever it is. I work with Bernie Sanders. He's an honorable person. He is a, a committed progressive. I agree with him on many issues. And I'm, in fact, Bernie and I were holding out for an even stronger bill on the Affordable Care Act. We wanted a, a single, we wanted an option, uh, an option to, to, to opt in, a public option. But, you know, uh, he and I both did, in the end, the responsible thing as we made sure that we got this piece of legislation through. But, I, of course, I agree with him on many issues. And uh, I also agree with Senator Clinton on a lot of them, almost all the issues. So I'm comfortable with both of them. I've worked with both of them very closely. And I think they both have shown themselves to be very responsible people who are talking about the issues in a mature way and who are clearly devoted to trying to solve the problems in this country. I would be going on a limb and say the Republican debates don't look like that. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a sideshow. And, and, and Mike, I look at it this way, because Bernie is a very honorable person. I think about when I was a 10-year-old kid, actually a little younger for the Kennedy-Nixon debates. You know, you form your view of politics and how you treat people from those who are in that stage. And I remember Nixon and Kennedy, and the dignity of the debate, the, the, how well informed they were. Ten-year-old kid now, hearing about Muslims being talked about in a certain way, Latinos being talked about in a certain way, having a presidential candidate saying he could shoot somebody on the street on Fifth Avenue and he'd still be popular. How does this help our society in the future? Providing that kind of guidance to our kids. I think it's terrible. And that's why I'm very comfortable with a, the Democratic candidate, whoever it is, because it, none of that stuff's going to go on. And clearly not comfortable with the prospect of Donald Trump as... as no, I, I would say that is very safe, I am comment. <laughs> I, uh, what, what do you think? I mean, I, anybody would be fascinated to see that, but, you know, you can turn off the TV, but... No. But, but what do you think his presidency, if, if Donald Trump were to be president, what do you think his presidency would mean to this country? Well, you know, I saw what happened when people felt that President Bush uh, was not presenting a good face to the rest of the world uh, with regard to Iraq and a number of other things, even though as a, as a person, and personally his conduct was very different than Donald Trump. So that was bad enough. People asking, what, what is the deal here? Why would you have somebody with this mentality be your president? This would be 10 times worse in terms of the way in which we're perceived by the rest of the world. I mean, the House of Commons has a pretty long history. For them to take time to debate whether Donald Trump should be allowed into the country is a sign with our closest ally that this is probably not going to advance our position in the world. And let's not do it. Uh, in 2012, you were a co-chair of President Obama's re-election campaign, and I think at that time you said that you thought he'd done a good job on foreign policy uh, matters. And so my question is this, given some of the recent developments in, in our world, uh, given uh, the rise of ISIS, given the terrorist attacks we've seen overseas or in our own country, do you still think he's done a good job at, at uh, foreign policy? Well, I think he greatly improved our image in the world with his demeanor and his approach, which I think was a very important thing. I think that he has done uh, historic things in terms of improving our situation with a couple of countries who are probably never going to be great friends, to say the least, but at least volatile situations. One being Cuba, which 
has been a thorn in our side for decades because of presidential politics in Florida. He very effectively is moving toward normalizing that. And with regard to Iran, he's kept his eye on the ball, and that is stopping them from getting a nuclear weapon. Instead of just talking about it, instead of saying they're our enemy, and, and of course they're not our friend, and they in many ways are like an enemy, but he kept his eye on the ball. And he invested enormous effort, and the Secretary of State did, to get an agreement where we're not absolutely certain it's going to work, but it looks like it's starting to work. The cement's been poured. This can lead to a stopping of Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, and that has to happen. So on those scores, I feel very good. I disagree with him, as we've already talked about, on, on trade stuff. I think he's way too quick to go along with these trade agreements. And as I already warned in 2011, when Republicans weren't saying anything about it, they weren't really talking about al-Qaeda. This is not just the president. They weren't talking about what was happening in Northern Africa. They were moving on to other things, you know, suing about Obamacare. I was writing and talking about the threat that continued from extremists all around the world. And so my view is that no one in Washington has taken this as seriously as they should, and now we have to deal with it. But those who say the way to handle it is to go put 100,000 troops into the area where ISIS is, which is what Senator Johnson wants to do, how does this work? <laughs> there was so a he, wants 20, he has said 25,000 American, yes. the rest would be a coalition of the willing. I said 100,000, like 100, 25,000 like Americans. Right. 25,000 Americans, and he was asked on television, so what do you do after you sort of break it, when, after you're there? He just looked at the camera and said, oh, we'll talk to the Sunni governments. That's what we're already doing. And how does this address the broader issue? I'm amazed that people just talk about ISIS. What about Al-Qaeda? None of these guys are talking about Al-Qaeda. It is an Al-Qaeda affiliate, AQIM, that did the attack in Burkina Faso. It is, in fact, <laughs> San Bernardino. People talk about this as being ISIS-inspired. The evidence is that those people were following Al-Awaki, the Al-Qaeda guy that we killed, who was in Yemen. So what are we going to do? Invade this place? What about Indonesia where the attack was? So this has to be a global strategy. And for political uh, reasons, sometimes people just take the latest tragedy, the scariest group, but it doesn't make any sense because this is a network. And some of these are even competing groups. We need to do something far more effective than just invading. Invading our way to security isn't going to work. So, so I'd, I'd be happy to talk about it. Yeah, so what does it look like? Uh, how, how do we stop groups like ISIS? How do we stop al-Qaeda from, from flourishing? How do we do that? If we don't put boots on the ground, as some suggest, how do we do it? You choke them off. And one of the things you do, first of all, is yes, you do have targeted attacks on their leaders, including I support uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Ash Carter's announcement that there'll be a special force specifically based in Iraq to do that. But you have to do much more than that. This is a, this is a group that wants to hit, create a caliphate. They have, they have a, their ideas, they have a nation there. You choke off their ability to function. So the first thing you do in addition to what I just mentioned is cut off their finances. I was surprised that, the, that the, our intelligence agencies let it be known, but the other day they blew up a big warehouse full of Iraqi cash. They use that cash to get around. And that's sort of smaller change than the issue of, of financial transactions, but we have much more capacity now than we used to through the internet, through our Department of Treasury and others, to go after their ability to transfer money. So you cut off their finances. You cut off their ability to make money off of oil. We have to get at those oil fields that they have. That is not an impossible task. But here again, there's the problem with the invasion idea. One of their oil beachheads apparently is on the Libyan coast. So you're going to throw in 100,000 over there in Libya, too, to handle this? No. You do targeted attacks. What about arms supplies? Unfortunately, the United States and Russia, who don't like ISIS, have been a little too active in, in uh, allowing this kind of arm trade. We should cut that off. We're going to need more intelligence officers on the ground. I served on the Intelligence Committee for five years, so I feel very confident talking about this. We don't have enough human intelligence officers in these places. We do not have the resources to make sure we find out what's going on in these places. You know, right now, ISIS can just recruit people, apparently, and they're like, okay, come on in, we'll train you. I want them wondering if that kid that they bring in is really who he is. I want them to lose their security 
to lose their mojo. And I want them exposed for not being this, this great sort of little country. Well, you know, a couple of very brave people got in there and took a picture of the food lines in the caliphate. And they managed to kill one of them, but getting at their propaganda. And then, of course, we need to pursue whatever we can diplomatically to resolve the issues between the countries in that region so they can unify against ISIS. So this is what it really looks like. It doesn't look like what the incumbent senator says. We just got to send 100,000 troops over there, and, and we'll just take over the area. It doesn't work. But I'm talking about works. And I've worked both as a senator and in a diplomatic position on the fine-tuning of how it works. And I can tell you I am eager to get out there and work on it again. Uh, you were the, uh, the lone member of the Senate to vote against the, uh, the Patriot Act in October of uh, 2001. Uh, that's going to be an issue in this campaign. Uh, and you know that uh, Senator Johnson is going to come after you and say, look, you know, we live in dangerous times. And Russ Feingold is this guy out here all by himself. What are you going to say? Well, I wish him luck because they tried that in 2004. Those were tough times. They ran ad and ad and ad against me saying that it was wrong to vote against the Patriot Act. And the people of this state overwhelmingly said, we're glad somebody read the bill. We're glad somebody said, if you aren't doing anything wrong, the government shouldn't be able to get at what you do. And I continue to believe that. That legislation hasn't been fixed. There are still many things about it that have nothing to do with terrorism. In fact, a number of the provisions have really put in there to allow drug, drug uh, issues, domestic issues. It was an old wish list of the FBI, as Bob Novak, the Republican columnist, said at the time. So look, I believe we should probably strengthen our resources, not only internationally in terms of intelligence, as I already said. I think we're going to probably need more resources, for example, for, for the FBI, for investigations. One of the things that made me very sorry was to hear that in San Bernardino, they had to pull people off of other investigations in order to investigate that. Well, if they need more resources to pursue legitimate investigations of people they're concerned about, let's do that. But let's not throw all the rest of us in. Uh, and create the kind of government that I think our founders really believed was inappropriate. So believe me, I will stand by that vote. It was the right vote. It was the right thing to do. Do you think the Patriot Act in any way kept America safe after 9-11? Well, there were a number of provisions in the Patriot Act that I thought were appropriate. In fact, I've always said that if you just counted up the provisions, about 90% of them were probably a good idea. For example, <laughs> before the Patriot Act, you could get some, if you had a wiretap permission, you could wiretap somebody's live conversation, but you couldn't get their voicemail because the law didn't know what a voicemail is. Of course, pretty soon the law is not going to know what a voicemail is either, again, because it's become obsolete. But, you know, that was just dumb. And then they needed longer periods of time for, uh, you know, statute of limitations, for biological attacks. So a lot of that made sense. But the problem was opportunity knocked. People knew that this bill was going to pass. And a number of provisions that simply are not appropriate were put in the bill and should be fixed. They do not reduce our security by fixing them. What did you think of the, the Edward Snowden revelations? I mean, when you look back and try and put some context around it, what did you think about what he did and, and what it's meant? Well, I think what he did was wrong. I, I don't think somebody should do that to the United States of America. Uh, what we learned in terms of this, the abuse of some aspects of our intelligence system is something that we have to take seriously and reform. Uh, but I simply am not going to endorse uh, that approach to revealing that kind of information. Let me ask you about a couple of things that are in the news right now. And, uh, and I know one of them you don't think much of as an issue, but I'll ask you about it because there are some commercials running around the state, and, and they go something along the lines of this, that in 2008 somebody who worked at the Toma VA in western Wisconsin uh, contacted your office and uh, tried to get your attention to, to say that uh, they had major problems at Toma. Some of you in this room know what those problems are, overprescription of painkillers, um, unfortunate death uh, years after of Jason Simkuski uh, from uh, Stevens Point, uh, a Marine. Um, and they're saying that uh, Russ Feingold knew about it and didn't do anything about it. Uh, what's your response to these ads that are now running uh, in the state of Wisconsin? You know, what passes for uh Legitimate political discourse these days is pretty amazing. I'm, I'm going to just take a little issue with your statement at sure. the beginning because you said I didn't think it was much of an issue. You didn't mean it 
in that way. I think it's the, one of the most important issues I've ever seen. Yeah, that, I'm not that, saying that no, no, what I happened understand. at home. I want to be very it, clear, though. Yeah. The issue of what happens to our veterans in a hospital like that and mistakes made like that leading to death of somebody is deadly serious. It's a terrible issue. But the idea that somehow somebody who didn't do his job, the incumbent senator, is terrified that that will be promoted, so he makes up a story, essentially, that somehow we knew about it, that's been completely debunked. The only person who they thought was going to say that has said explicitly that even though it was, they were supposed to get the memo to us, it never was done. We never got it. None of the four offices, uh, congressional offices, have any record or any recollection. That's because we never got it. And I'll tell you what, I know the people that work for me, they would have done something about it. I had the best people around. So the reason Senator Johnson's people are pushing this, they even took her into a meeting, and she said she felt used by Ron Johnson. They took her into a meeting and tried to get her to say that it had been delivered to us, but she refused to say it because it's not true. What is true is that Senator Johnson was informed of a complaint, and he said that he didn't get it to the appropriate people because he was busy interviewing people because he was going to become chairman of a committee, and he didn't discipline any of the people that had done wrong and screwed up. So naturally, he's going to try to somehow put it on us. But it's completely false and sad because this should be about protecting veterans. Using a tragedy involving our fighting men and women as a way to try to get yourself reelected is really kind of pathetic. And that's what's being done here. So let me ask one more question about that. Um, there's now this audio tape has been released, and in this audio tape, this person who uh, wanted to be a whistleblower um, says that she talked to, and she doesn't name any names, but she says she talked to people. So you're saying that she never talked to you, didn't talk to your we staff? We checked our records. We checked everything. There is nothing. And, you know, if it was just my office, it would be one thing. But if you look at Representative Kine's office, they say the same thing. It, 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 didn't, it didn't get to us. That's what she also says. She says she thought it was going to get to us. It didn't. We didn't know about it. But that doesn't diminish at all the seriousness, uh, seriousness of this going forward which has to do with making sure the VA does, which it usually does very well, which is protecting veterans. So, I mean, obviously the, there's no real case here that we are. I'd like to add to what you said too. I want to make sure that this is very clear, not diminishing the, what happened at Toma. We've done a number of stories on that. We talked about it a lot on our show. It's Absolutely. a huge issue. I think what you disputed was how you've been characterized. Yeah, turning it into a political discussion. football is what I, yeah. what I think is wrong. So here's the other thing that you're going to hear and, uh, uh, and are starting to hear um, as the campaign moves forward, and that's Russ Bengold <laughs> has changed. And, um, you know, I remember the, the Tammy Baldwin, Tommy Thompson uh, election, and, and the message was that Tommy Thompson had changed. Now, you and Tommy Thompson are very different people, clearly. But the, the attempt is to remake... <laughs> No, but, but the attempt is to remake Russ Feingold's image in the eyes of Wisconsinites. And they're going to say, and are saying, uh, Russ Feingold used to say, um, I would never take a majority of my contributions from out of state. This time around, I'm willing to do that. What do you say to, to people who are going to make that argument that, that you're a different guy than you were the last time around? Well, I'll tell you something. <laughs> When I said in 1992, whenever I said that I would get a majority of my contributions from Wisconsin citizens, I made that pledge for that term. What I did not anticipate was that the United States Supreme Court would take all of our campaign finance laws and throw them in the garbage can, allowing corporations and billionaires and people like Ron Johnson to have a super PAC where you don't even necessarily know with some of this money where it's coming from, that we're supposed to just go, oh, okay, <laughs> everything's the same. Things do change. We still get enormous amount of our contributions from Wisconsin. In fact, 25,000 contributions, a lot more than Senator Johnson gets. We get 90% of our contributions from, from people, 90% of our contributions are $100 or less. It is a grassroots campaign from all 72 counties in Wisconsin. So if people, in addition to those people, want to contribute to my campaign, let's face it, this involves very serious issues that are people are concerned about all across the country. So I'm very comfortable 
in light of the changes that have occurred because of uh, Citizens United, that we would have a different approach. But we still will have far more support in Wisconsin than Ron Johnson will. So ask yourself, who is more Wisconsin? Now, in terms of changing, uh, as my wife said to me, gee, I hope you've changed some. <laughs> you know, pe people that don't change at all. I haven't changed my commitment to integrity and telling the truth and Wisconsin values, but I've been changed by teaching students. I've been changed by seeing the horrible tragedy in Eastern Congo of six million people being killed, two million people being sexually assaulted. I've been changed by the experience of, of losing an election and then going back and having people say, would you come back? These are healthy things. It's part of becoming a person who really can relate to other people. And I'm, I feel good about who I am at this point, but it's not exactly the same person I was previously. Some people think this will be the race that will determine who controls the Senate. Do you agree with that characterization? You know, I don't know. I'm running, Mike, because the people of this state are hurting, because I have benefited, my family has benefited, next year it'll be 100 years of fine golds in Wisconsin. And we have had the most wonderful experience here. And so to me, it's not you know, counting up numbers in Washington or who's going to attack who. It's my obligation, my desire to restore people to a belief in this great progressive state where people get along, where people treat each other with respect. That is important to me at this stage of my life. And it's important to my friends. And it's important to so many of you in the room who have devoted your lives to the great traditions of this state. So that's what I'm thinking about. I, you know, I will figure out who's in the majority if I get out there and go to the right room. <laughs> but that's not what it's about for me. All right, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, the way we do this is, for those of you in the seating bowl, please press down on the rim, not on the ball, but keep your finger down on the rim <laughs> so that we can, yeah, you remember these days. Yeah, I do, that's and then, a familiar and, setting. And uh, just hold it there and, uh, and we'll get your question. And then if you're in the back, uh, we have Ryan, uh, the gentleman over here, has a microphone. He will come and stand and hold the microphone for your question. So please raise your hands, I'll call on you. Uh, no speeches, please, we say that at all our events. Keep the questions concise, we'll get to as many as possible. We'll start right down here. Uh, what do you think Mike Bloomberg's entry into the presidential race would have on the campaign? You know, I, I'm not at all sure. Um, I think probably one billionaire candidate is enough. Uh, <laughs> but you know, he's, he's an interesting figure. A lot of people say he did a good job in New York. Um, I uh, hope that people will take a very good look at our Democratic nominee, who I suspect will be the strongest candidate to actually run the country based on experience and ability. So um, I've got nothing against Bloomberg, but he's not going to be my candidate. Did you have a question over there? Yes. So don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm delighted you're back in politics, but given your reasoning that you were concerned about Wisconsin, um, why now and why not the um, race for governor when we were in much worse condition. Well, look, I, I don't consider myself somebody who's somebody that's just sort of an automaton that runs for office all the time. The people of the state told me to take a break. So I did. I didn't think it was appropriate for me to go, oh, I'm back. You know? I thought it should, there should be some time. And so did my family. Uh, I thought it was time to see if I could do some other things. Teaching here wasn't easy. It's a real challenge to teach students. Trying to negotiate with rebel groups in Congo is a real challenge. Writing a book is not easy. <coughs> I felt that I needed to do some other things. And I honestly didn't know if I would ever run for office again. I assumed I wouldn't. But as things continued to happen in the state and people kept talking, they said, is there some point at which you might be willing to come back? And I said, you would never want me to run until I want to run. People can tell if you don't want to run. Ask Jeb Bush. <laughs> You're a lousy candidate. So, you know, I felt I owed it to anybody who wanted me to run for office that I had to be prepared to do it. And over time, it began to be something I felt I could do. And I'm having a great time. 
The people of this state are resilient. Yes, they've come through a tough time, but I like to think of myself as part of not just trying to change a Senate seat, but to change the tenor of what's going on in the state. And I'm in a place right now personally where I can do a good job of that. So let, let me follow up on that real yeah, quickly. Sure. You made an interesting comment. You said people told you to take a break. In 2000, they, they did. They did. 2010. They did. So what did you <laughs> what did you learn from 2010 that you're applying in this election? That if you run for public office, you you have to be a person who understands that the winds blow in different directions, that your particular vision is not going to be exactly what people want, and that when people are in very rough economic times, and when they are told. Uh, a bunch of baloney about a health care bill, they're probably going to vote out the people that are in front of them in that election. And of course, that's what happened. Now, those are things that you generally can't change. There was no way, basically, of changing that unless I was going to say, oh, I, I didn't really believe I should vote for the health care bill. I'm sorry I did. That's not what I believed. So I thought the right thing to do was to run, stand by what I had done, and face the consequences, which I did. A number of my former colleagues chose not to run because they knew they were going to lose. I had a pretty good sense of what was going to happen myself. But I felt I needed to stand for what I believed in, whether I would win or lose. So what I learned is that even though people might not support you in a particular election, if you conduct yourself honorably and honestly, maybe they'll ask you to come back again. And that's what we'll find out in November. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. I'll take that was more questions from the audience. <laughs> Let me go to this gentleman in the green shirt. Ryan, hang on before you ask your question. Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Nearly two years ago, I lost a friend to heroin. What are you going to do to help combat this health ep epidemic? This has been a, so you lost a friend to heroin. And that big issue in New Hampshire, you see the candidates talking about it. What, what can you do as a senator? For those of us that actually spend time around this state and have grown up here, this is not new. I knew a kid at Middleton High School that knew my kids, who died of heroin quite a few years ago. I did whatever I could when I was in the Senate to pursue this issue, including some of the stuff that was coming in. I remember meeting with all the law enforcement officials here about the Nigerian heroin trade, where they would fly into Mitchell instead of O'Hare, because they didn't, didn't feel that people were, were following that. And so this issue has been around for a long time, but here's what's a little upsetting about it, is that there's a tendency for us to get more serious about stuff like this when it comes to wealthier people. And this is one of those issues, where when it affects people in the central city and other places, oh, well, that's a, you know, that's a problem. But now it's becoming a real ep epidemic, and, and this is where it's critical to realize. Those who are litigating and talking about getting rid of the president's health care bill are talking about getting rid of treatment. Mm -hmm. And you need treatment and treatment and treatment to get people off of something horrible like this. So obviously we have to fight it from coming in here, and I've had experience working with law enforcement and trying to do that. By the way, the meth, mm -hmm. the meth labs. I've been in northern Wisconsin, on, on, uh, at the Lacoudere and other uh, communities. They are feeling enormous concern about meth usage and to some extent in certain places the state meth labs. So this isn't new. These things are getting worse and my approach of going to every county and listening to people, which I did in office and which I'm doing right now, causes me to know about this stuff a lot earlier uh, than the incumbent senator who is just suddenly talking about it in his sixth year is going, you know, there's a drug problem out there. We didn't hear anything about that, basically, for years. But if you listen to the people of the state and go to their communities, you'd know this is an ongoing matter, and we do need those treatment dollars. Thanks for the question. Sorry for your loss. We'll go down right here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Senator, regarding uh, Guantanamo Bay, do you favor closing it or keeping it open and do you agree or disagree with the release of those prisoners back to the Middle East, or should we be bringing them to the United States courts? Well, first of all, I do think it should be closed. I, I, having followed the, this, uh, the perceptions of this uh, on a number of roles that I've played, 
it's not worth it, given the reputation of the place in terms of our reputation and our image, to simply keep that. So I don't think it makes sense. I think it has to be on a case-by-case -case basis with regard to individuals. I'm not going to talk about any across-the-board situation, but look, if we have evidence that people have committed crimes, they can be prosecuted through our system. Uh, and there are people that we found out probably shouldn't be there at all, and they need to be released. So there's no easy answer, uh, but I do think that we need to close it, and I think the president hopefully will complete that. It's not easy because of the congressional attempts to block it, but I do think we, we're not overall benefiting from having that facility. Other questions? Well, let, me, uh, let me go back here. I'm trying to move around the room a little bit. Yes, please hold down the, uh, the rim. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Senator. Um, Am I uh, imagining things when I worked for the feds for about 30 years, most of it overseas with the State Department? Um, I've come back to where I was born and raised, and I get a sense here that people see things through this uh, conspiratorial optic regarding public institutions and the federal government and things. And I'm happily uh, up here in the Midwest with my family and uh, once again, but I can't believe the kinds of things I hear, you know, in town meetings and stuff like this regarding the malign. Uh, um, if you will, focus that the federal government has, you know, to, to do all kinds of bad things to us. And I've never experienced that having grown up here before. Now that I'm back, I find it rather disturbing. Am I imagining things about this? I mean, we see it with the Bundys out there in Oregon, you know, and all of this stuff, and these crazy reactions of the right-wing militias and things. Yeah, have you got any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I would say if I had to choose between uh, skepticism toward the federal government versus Ex blind acceptance of the federal government, I'll take the skepticism. But I don't think it should go too far. The idea that there is no merit to things that happen at the national level and the role of the federal government is obviously very counterproductive. And if you've ever spent time with, for example, as I had the opportunity to do in 18 years on the Foreign Relations Committee and five years on the Intelligence Committee, when you realize what people such as our CI agents do with the way they have to live, the kind of life that they choose to live to protect us, that's the federal government. When you think about our troops and our military people, and you know, because of what's happened, having been to Afghanistan and Iraq and having been to so many of these places around the world, I mean, that's the federal government as well. Not to mention that in many crucial moments, a partnership between the federal government and things that we need for our communities is, is very valuable. But I'm glad there's skepticism. I'm glad that people realize that the Patriot Act was extreme and unnecessary, that power tends to want to expand power, and that if you don't watch the federal government and be very tough on what the federal government wants to do and very critical and have good oversight, that they will possibly go too far. I think that's the healthy tension that our founders believed in. And, and so, obviously, I don't believe in violence or any of these things related to it, but I, I think the day that skepticism toward the federal government stops is, is not a good day in this country. Mm -hmm. Other questions? There's somebody way in the back of the room. You had to make it hard on us, didn't you? Is it, <laughs> that's no problem. Thank you. Um, hi, I was hoping you could share your opinions on the changes being made to Wisconsin abortion laws and the general movement to defund Planned Parenthood. I'm just so sad that after all these years of trying to make sure a woman's reproductive rights would be protected, that just like this Toma thing, it's being used as a political football. That it is an attempt to try to make women feel uncomfortable about making those choices in any way they can. And I think the attack on Planned Parenthood is dead wrong. I think it is, provides very important services to many people in this state and has to be protected. And so I feel very strongly about that. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm a second year law student here. Uh, when I graduate next year, I'll be close to like $180,000 in debt for my undergrad in law school. Yeah, that's a house. So um, this could be an obvious question, but just to hear you say it and get it on the record. Um, right now, Congress is talking about getting rid of the 10-year public service loan forgiveness. If you go and you know work for the government, whether it's a politician or whatever, um, 
do you oppose that? Do you support it? What are your ideas? I think, I think we've got to find creative ways to, to make it so you can be relieved of such a terrible debt. And let's be very clear, this is on the merits. Senator Johnson has said repeatedly that he doesn't believe there, the federal government should even be involved in student loans. What does that mean? It means that you have to be born into the right family. And that's a hard thing to achieve in advance. <laughs> so how can that be? How can that be that you have to start off your life $180,000 in debt when he and I didn't have to do that? That's just wrong. That's a denial of the American dream. So look, in addition to the things we already talked about, possibility of block grants to try to get tuition lower, I think creative ways to help people pay off that debt is a great idea. And I'm going to think about what you said. Yes. Um, Press down on the rim. Yeah. Talk? Okay. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Um, money and politics, you mentioned that first thing you came in. So I'm wondering how you feel about a constitutional amendment that says only human beings have constitutional rights and money isn't speech. Well, I think that certainly is the right way to look at the law. I think the decision in Citizens United that somehow crafted different pieces of history was just wrong with regard to the idea that corporations are people in this regard. Corporations are creatures of the state. They don't even have to allow them. How can they be people? So I think the decision was terrible. I think most legal scholars think it was a poor legal decision. But in terms of the answer, let's overturn the decision. A constitutional amendment is an incredibly difficult process, even with something that's not controversial, because it takes so much effort in so many states. Overturning the decision is fairly straightforward. It was five to four. This is only because people, different people came on the court. McCain-Feingold was upheld five to four. All of a sudden, Sandra Day O'Connor's not there, and a different justice is there, and bing, they decide to overturn a 1907 law signed by Teddy Roosevelt that said the corporation shouldn't be able to do this. There was no record in that case. This is a lousy piece of law. And so that's why this election's so important. <laughs> that person gets to decide who the next justices are going to be. I predict that it will be a Democrat. I predict that Democrat will appoint people who will follow the appropriate view of the law and that that decision will be overturned long before we would be able to pass a constitutional amendment. So obviously, I think the talk about a constitutional amendment really helps people realize how serious this is, and it's a good part of the conversation. But I am very determined to do what I can uh, to set up a scenario where we have a Democratic majority in the Senate and a Democratic president, uh, at least for that purpose, or at least a reasonable Republican minor minority in the Senate if I had to settle for that. One more uh, very brief question. Yeah, didn't see you down here. Thank you. Just on the rim. There you go. Okay. Um, I thought that uh, your level-headedness following 9-11 was a high-water mark. Uh, however, since then, the rise of the congressional military-industrial complex of spying on our own citizens, information gathering beyond all knowing, <coughs> has been unprecedented. Where is the check and the balance when we have secret courts, an administration that is prosecuting whistleblowers as never before, and the only person to step forward is Ed Snowden, and, he's dim and, and he is demonized? So where does the citizen turn? Where is the check and the balance? Thank you. Well, the check and balance has to come from your elected representatives. And I am a person who goes back to the Senate if I'm able to prevail who believes that there were mistakes made by passing that Patriot Act. As a member of the Intelligence Committee, I got to find out about how that secret court works, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Back when Justice Judge Roberts was before the Judiciary Committee, I, it was about his own, only really candid moment. I said, what do you think about this secret court? And he actually said, well, when I first looked at it, it seemed pretty strange that we would have secret courts. See, here's the problem with that kind of a court. They're given essentially no discretion so that in the case of these petitions under the National Security Surveillance, all the government has to do is come in and say, we want to pursue this person because we think it's related to terrorism. In other words, they don't have to prove the person did anything wrong. And they approved it almost every single time. It's a secret court where people on the other side don't even get to present their views. So this is an example of what was so wrong 
with that. So you need people who will be elected and will use their role to do things like go on the Intelligence Committee, which I did, where I fought very hard to identify terrorist threats in Africa. I was commended by the head of our intelligence community after the election for having taken the lead in the country on identifying these threats in Africa. But I also made sure that I pursued these questions as an elected representative. I think that's a far better way to go than, than somebody like Snowden who did something that I have some problems with. I'm gonna wrap things up there. Uh, I'll thank uh, Senator Feingold in a moment. Um, and we, yes, we do to still call people by their formal names. Um, uh, just, I would say, people are sensitive these days, believe me. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyhow, I just wanted to uh, mention that we've got a really busy couple of weeks here at the law school, and we hope you can come back and join us for future events. Um, tomorrow we have uh, a couple of representatives of the uh, group Common Ground in southeast Wisconsin. Many of you know of their work during the uh, arena discussions here in Wisconsin. We'll be talking to them. Uh, on Thursday, we will be releasing our next Marquette University Law School full, uh, poll. Uh, poll Director Charles Franklin will join me for that discussion. And then next week, uh, three more events. On Tuesday, Milwaukee County Circuit Court Judge David Borowski talking about uh, some of the challenges facing our justice system today. On Thursday, Waukesha's water diversion request, that request to divert water from Lake Michigan. We'll be talking with the mayor of Waukesha, Sean Riley, and the mayor of Racine, John Dickert, who is opposed to the request. And then on Friday of next week, because we are all about fairness here at the law school, Senator Ron Johnson will be here to talk about probably some of the same issues we've discussed today. Yep. Having said that, I'd like to say thanks again to all of you for being here, and our thanks today to Russ Feingold for joining us. <laughs>